Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11720 in the name of Neil Finlay on the Umbrellas Company contract scam. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I now invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr Finlay, if you are ready, uh, seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. Um, nothing will surprise me any more about the way in which uh, the biggest players in the construction industry treat their workers. The lengths that some of these companies will go to cut wages, erode conditions and increase profits at the expense of ordinary working people is a familiar story for too many construction workers. We see skilled tradesmen, brickies, sparks, joiners, etc., who work in some of the biggest construction projects in our country, building houses, schools and the hospitals that we all rely on being systematically ripped off time and again. But the reality is, of course, some things never change. At the start of the last century, Robert Tressel wrote about these very same practices in his classic book, The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist. He wrote about how greed, deceit and intimidation was used by the then bosses to exploit and control building workers. How they kept wages down as profits soared and how the threat of the sack and hunger was used to keep workers in their place. The classic scene where the great money trick, as explained by Frank Owen, has simply been reinvented by the construction bigwigs of today. History does indeed repeat itself. In the 70s, it was the lump that brought about the national building trade strike. Then, the case of the Shrewsbury pickets, still campaigning for justice. We've had the blacklisting scandal, and still none of these companies have owned up, apologised, or compensated their victims. And yet still, to this day, we are awarding contracts like the V&A and Dundee, the Aberdeen Bypass, and the New Dunfries Hospital to these companies. We've had the exploitation of agency workers and bogus self-employment, and now we have the umbrella company's scam. This latest attack on workers' rights is what Steve Murphy, General Secretary of UCAT, calls the most devious and complex one yet. And I'll tell you, that is some claim. So how does this work? Well, uh, this was a direct response by the companies to the UK government's decision to ban employment agencies from falsely claiming that construction workers were self-employed. Companies and agencies were pretending workers were self-employed to avoid paying employers' national insurance contributions. And lobbying by the construction unions and workers themselves forced the government's hand. So what did the employers do? Did they pay the national insurance and set, accept that their scam had been rumbled and it was over? Did they hell? They never, ever do. They simply moved on to their next cunning plan, a 21st century version of the great money trick. What happens is that employment agencies use a very complex pay structure to pass on to workers the cost of employers' national insurance and the processing of pay. Agencies are able to pass on these costs, which would normally be met by employers, by putting an umbrella or composite company between themselves and the staff they recruit. By using these companies as middlemen to pay workers, agencies engineer a situation where the amount a construction worker receives in their pay packet is often a lot less than the rate agreed when he or she took the job. In some cases, people expecting 13, 14 or 15 pounds per hour actually receive the minimum wage plus whatever amount the umbrella company sees fit to pay on top. They also encourage workers to submit bogus or exaggerated travel uh, and food expenses claims to boost their wages to make up the money that is taken from them by the umbrella company. One pay slip that I recently saw passed to me by a worker shows £277 of basic pay and £389 of expenses. And you know what? If the worker gets caught over claiming expenses, it's they who are taken to task by HMRC, not the agency or the contractor. In this great money trick, everyone games except the person who actually does the graft. The agencies gain by saving the cost of employers' national insurance some, eh, eh, costs. The umbrella company gains by making a profit by charging a fee paid for by workers, a fee for processing pay and charging for a pay slip. A pay slip that is often so bamboozling that the employee cannot fathom out what they should or shouldn't be paid and the contractor benefits in the long term from lower staff costs. And, President Officer, this type of arrangement is spreading like wildfire throughout construction and other sectors. 
I attended a lobby of this parliament by Unite, UCAT and the GMB prior to Christmas. And there I heard of workers from the Denny Power Station who had this happen to them. We've got workers around the corner from this building on the new university accommodation run by Arch Blacklisters Balfour Beatty. They're subject to payment via umbrella companies. I'm advised by Unite that they're being used by contractors on the INEOS site at Grangemouth and at the fabrication yard at Methyl. And we suspect they're being used on the Fourth Bridge contract too, and many, many more contracts. And of course, uh, it's not just the worker who loses out, it's also the government and the taxpayer who lose out. An analysis by UCAT has revealed that the government receives significantly less tax when a worker is employed via this scam. This is because when the um, umbrella company pay the worker, uh, they pay a, 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 a rate less than the rate he or she agreed. There's, there's also less income tax and national insurance to pay. And when an umbrella company uses expenses to top up that pay, those expenses are entirely exempt from tax and insurance. So, someone earning £500 a week via an umbrella company pays £3,800 a year less in tax and insurance than they otherwise would have. And it also impacts on pension arrangements and holiday pay too. And on top of this, we see pernicious zero-hours contracting uh, uh, being brought in as well. So, what should happen? Well, I recognise that some of this requires action at a UK level. But as always, there are things the Scottish Government should and could do. Trade unions are calling for employment agencies and other employers to be obliged to employ workers directly, not via umbrella companies. The hourly rate agreed between a worker and an employer, including an employment agency, should be the rate that that worker is paid. There should be a legal duty to make payment uh, arrangements transparent and easy to, for the worker to understand. It should be obligatory for employers to pay uh, reimbursement of travel and expenses in addition to a worker's hourly, hourly rate and holiday pay should never be rolled up into a worker's weekly pay and all forms of bogus self-employment should be abolished. A lot, of the, a lot of this could be achieved via public procurement guidance and in tender specification and scoring but that requires political will. Only last week uh, writing in the Morning Star, Richard Leonard of the GMB exposed the government's duplicity on blacklisting at the V&A in Dundee. Uh, on Friday, we heard there is a delay, uh, that they have delayed the procurement guidance on the living wage until after the general election. They don't, government doesn't have a good record on these issues. I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's offer of a meeting on this issue and I thank her for that. But I hope that 104 years after Trestle's death, we can get some action on this to end such Victorian practices. Many thanks. Uh, I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Cara Hilton. Four minute speeches or thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I thank Neil Finlay for bringing this uh, uh, issue to the Chamber? And I was delighted to sign the motion to allow it to, to come here. Um, Presiding Officer, I have to say a few thanks first before I get into the body of my speech because for the past um, couple of years now, there's been three uh, men in my life from a trade union point of view who have helped um, inform me and keep this place informed of some of the issues that have been going on in the the construction industry. Stuart Hume, Neil Milligan and Greg MacArthur, who are with us in the gallery today, have been immensely helpful to me in ensuring that I understand the issues that they are going through. Presiding officer, one of the clearest things about any scam is that there is an inbuilt cycle. A sales pitch, a recipient, an unchallengeable deal that costs money, essential to making it work. That's why most get blown out fairly rapidly. Once people are aware, they're empowered to avoid. I hope that the fact that this seedy business is under discussion today is achieving just that awareness. Equipped with the knowledge that may not have that we have at the moment, workers across the construction industry and trades will have the collective power through their union to hopefully say no. Colleagues have already explained how umbrella companies work for employers and agencies while they fail for workers. If you've ever set your eyes on a payslip, run through the deliberately confusing system, you'll know why so many people are completely baffled about why they're suddenly receiving anything up to a third less money at the end of the week. Many workers don't realise they've signed up to their employer's national insurance contributions, lose their holiday pay and pension rights, and perhaps also be subject to a weekly fee of around £30 for the payroll company. 
St such dis deductions come via employment agencies engaged in this practice. Not only does the agency not pay the workers, employers, national insurance contribution, they also gain this additional fee. Contractors benefit because they get the experienced workers on reduced labour costs. This dissembling is intentional, of course. Normal pay slips show deductions and their purposes clearly. On umbrella company pay slips, there is no itemisation of deductions. Workers just see a lower final amount than they expected. Then there's the other complicated layer about expenses. We've heard some of that from Neil Finlay today. Workers have been told that they can make up the balance of their normal pay by claim expenses like travel and subsistence. The impact that then has on pension contributions is immense. So this is not an issue for their weekly pay slip. It's a, a, an issue for when they eventually retire. Many people on contract and a lot of construction workers are employed in short term contracts. And we heard some of that today. They are already entitled to claim travel and subsistence. So this really is part of the scam that's been used. These payments are tax-free because they are reimbursements. Umbrella companies provide a legal opportunity to top up low wages with this mechanism. For those who don't have any travel or subsistence costs, the wage will stay at the low end of the scale. Many, perhaps most, are coerced into accepting these new arrangements. They're really being told, take it or leave it. And since most workers can't afford to leave it, they have to take it. The deductions suddenly introduced aren't offering any benefit to the worker, rather the benefit only to the employers who no longer pay the portion of national insurance contributions. They then may add a fee, which will potentially um, to manage, to, manage um, to avoid taxation on a massive scale. And I know that this place and many of my colleagues don't agree with some of the companies who already tax avoid. There are losers above and beyond the workers themselves. Low tax revenues for the Treasury and the NHS lose and the NHS loses out well because unpaid national insurance contributions mean less for hospitals, nurses and doctors, of course. Neil Finlay. Uh, I accept that some of these issues lie with the UK government, but uh, does she accept that if there is the political will between us and this Parliament that um, we could agree that there could be amendments to either the, uh, the procurement bill or the procurement uh, guidance that could wipe out some of this at that stage in all public procurement. I think if Mr Finlay was actually up to the, the minute with some of his information, you would know the consultation is with the STUC right now and maybe he should go and talk to his pals and the Labour Party who are involved in that process. It is entirely illegal and the reality doesn't seem to be bothering HMRC in the least. I'm nearly finished, Neil. The best, of they, the best they can manage is to say that it might update guidelines so that the workers better understand what they're getting into. But skills trades people working in construction sites don't normally have the luxury of saying no thanks. It won't, they won't bother taking up the job. Yet again, we have a clear example of how Westminster control leaves us in Scotland helpless to act on behalf of the workers who are victims of this abuse. We need power over employment rights, not a submission in the Smith Commission from yep. the Labour Party at all. Well, they were helping their wee, Tory, their wee Tory pals. We need to kill this practice. We need to tell it before it becomes an official hold and becomes normal, acceptable work on practice. It's an abhor abhorrent scam. People in employment expect and deserve decent close, and please. fair treatment. And governments have the obligation that these, these obligations are enshrined in law and delivered in practice. United has made it very clear in their opposition of this abusive system and has very clearly set out the ways to do that. The UK government must play by the rules and honour its responsibility towards the working people and those working men up in that gallery today. Many thanks. And I now call on, I now order, I now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Alex Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by congratulating Neil Finlay on securing this important debate. The umbrella company scam is something that's been ignored for too long and I hope that we can send out a message today that we don't accept this type of exploitation and abuse here in Scotland. I'd like to take the opportunity to commend all that have worked so hard to push this issue up onto the political agenda and particularly the trade unions, UCAT and Unite and I was pleased to join some of the reps outside the parliament earlier. UCAT have produced an eye-opening report called the umbrella company contract which outlines the scale of the problem and the impact on workers. It shines a light into the dark and murky world of the umbrella companies which have boomed in the past year. In fact, a recent episode of Dispatches estimated that 200,000 workers across the UK are currently being paid by umbrella companies. Many of them are working in Britain's biggest public construction projects. This is a scam that means not only does a worker pay their own national insurance contributions, they also have to pay the cost of processing their own wages and pay their employer's national insurance too. 
Trade unions have estimated that payment via an umbrella company is costing construction workers as much as £120 a week, as well as cost to the Treasury in the form of lost revenue, estimated at almost £3,800 a year for the, an average worker, as Neil Finlay has already highlighted. But not only do these scams hit workers hard in their pockets, they also undermine collective national agreements. They make it difficult for unions to organise and to stand up for their members' rights at work. If workers refuse to accept the conditions, as Christina McKelvey has already pointed out, they're treated with contempt, they simply don't get the work. To add insult to injury, rather than the rate for the job, thousands of these highly skilled construction workers are officially now being paid just the minimum wage, forced to rely on expenses and performance pay to top this up. And it's not just wages that are hit, workers are losing out in pension entitlement and holiday pay too. Pay slips are often so complicated it's difficult for any worker to understand how their pay has been calculated. The amount is often a lot less than the rate that was agreed. In fact, many workers are losing out on hundreds of pounds every month. Zero-hour contracts are fast becoming the norm and job security for many workers has went out the window. Many are left with absolutely no idea how many hours they're going to work from one week to the next or how many money they'll be bringing home from one week to the next. The result, thousands of highly skilled and valued construction workers have been left feeling exploited, undervalued and demoralised. There's absolutely no doubt that the use of these con contracts is both unfair and exploitative. They've been used by unscrupulous employers to maximise their profits, to evade their taxes and their employer responsibilities. And it's workers up and down Scotland and across the UK who are paying the price. And what we're seeing now could, might only be the tip of the iceberg. It's already become impossible in some areas for workers to find jobs where their pay is not through an umbrella company. Unless we take action to crack down on this abuse, given the opportunity that these scams present to legally cut workers' pay, to cut employment costs and to boost profits, there's every chance that these umbrella companies will spiral and spread to other sectors of the economy too. And this will be a race to the bottom in which every worker in Scotland will lose. But it doesn't have to be like, like this. In Wales, the Labour government there is already acting to outlaw the use of umbrella companies on its construction projects. This is a step in the right direction, and I hope that today the Minister will take the opportunity to say that Scotland will follow Wales's lead. Last year, the SNP voted against Scottish Labour plans to ban these companies from winning public sector contracts, and I hope the Minister will think again and commit to using the procurement powers the Scottish Government has to ban the use of these contracts in all public sector contracts in Scotland. Workers on umbrella contracts can't afford to wait any longer. They deserve better than inaction from both the Scottish and the UK governments. Paying workers via an umbrella company is unfair, it's unjust and it's unacceptable. We've got, the Scottish Government have got the opportunity to show which side they're on and to end the misery that these workers are facing. To act now, as Wales already has, to end the scandal of umbrella companies and ensure that no company involved in these dodgy practices is engaged on any public contract here in Scotland. Thank you very much. I now call on Alex Johnson to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. I can I begin by thanking Neil Finlay for bringing this issue before Parliament. Uh, in this speech, I'm not going to make any uh, or attempt to repeat anything that's been said previously, but I hope I will set out a clear position from this side of the chamber, uh, which indicates the level to which we support the view that's been put forward. As Neil Finlay pointed out in his uh, opening remarks, there is, in fact, nothing new under the sun, and the schemes that are being described in this debate uh, have had their counterparts in previous times, and legislation has been required in order to cut out some of these practices. However, the whole notion of the bogus self-employment uh, self racket is something which has caused a great deal of concern across our labour force for a long, long time. And it's interesting that it is, in fact, attempts to cut down or reduce that loophole that have resulted in another opportunity for this uh, contract scam uh, to make an appearance. The fact is, however, that companies in difficult positions uh, are often faced with options to do things which are inappropriate, uh, but driven to do so perhaps by the structure that exists. In the broader sense, I would like to draw attention to the fact that while government has been working for some time to reduce tax thresholds, the fact that national insurance still remains uh, as it was before uh, is something which has caused some unacceptable decisions to be made. Perhaps it's appropriate that if we look at cutting tax on the lower paid in future, we consider exemption from national insurance contributions as a potential option to cut the temptation. 
But that's not to try it uh, 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 briefly. Yes. I, I would, uh, against his better nature, I would plead with Mr Johnson. Let's not make excuses for these companies. This is outrageous what's going on. Some of these are the most profitable companies that you will ever find in the construction world. Let's condemn what they're doing as wrong and you stop making excuses for them. I, I fully agree with Neil Finlay. Uh, what I was about to do is make it clear that I am not prepared to make excuses for these companies. We've seen major companies in this country involved in things before which have damaged their reputation. I have discussed with Neil Finlay on more than one occasion the issue of blacklisting uh, and we've considered what the possibility for uh, dealing with that might be. I would like to think that the blacklisting issue uh, may be behind this, although the consequences are not. But so I am surprised to discover that some of these same companies, or certainly companies in a similar position, once offered the opportunity to do something equally as dubious, seem only too happy to become involved in it. I believe that this is a complex issue, uh, and we need all of us to understand it. The concept of self-employment itself is not the problem. I myself was self-employed from the moment I left full-time education to the moment I became a member of this parliament. And it has to be said that self-employment does have a role and that role is complex. But that role is not in the area described here. I think it is vital that we, each and every one of us, do all we can to name and shame the companies that are involved to make it clear that this practice is unacceptable and to make sure that whatever our position, we do all we can to make sure that it is wiped out. It is only fair that in this day and age, a skilled man should get a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. And if anything steps in the way of that, then it's up to us all, regardless of our political position or our economic opinions, to say that this is wrong and it should be ended now. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Gordon MacDonald, after which move the closing speech from the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, too, thank Neil Finlay for bringing this important issue to the Chamber for debate. Umbrella companies have been in existence since 2000, and at the time, they mainly represented freelance workers who had fixed-term contracts. The problem is what they're now being used for. In April 2014, the UK Government passed legislation to crack down on false self-employment, where some employment agencies were pretending that workers were self-employed in order to avoid paying employers' national insurance. The UCAT report, the Umbrella Company contract, highlights that in order to ground this legislation in the spring of 2014, many construction workers were moved on block onto Umbrella Company contracts. This has resulted in this shameful situation of workers having to agree to zero-hour contracts, pay employees and employers' national insurance contributions, admin fees, losing out on pension contributions and potential cuts in their holiday pay. The GMB has called on the UK Government to step in to deal with tax avoidance abuse and scams, which it said are costing workers income and the Exchequer much-needed revenues. They also highlight that workers are seeing their salary slashed by these extra costs, but then pay is partially reboosted through scams using expenses, performance-related pay and other methods. But this situation could have been avoided. Over six years ago, HMRC investigated umbrella companies and produced a report detailing a number of issues, including invalid dispensations, ineffective overarching employment contracts, potentially illegal deductions, and all unlawful management processes. Other problems identified included non-compliance with dispensations, tax-free expense payments, and national minimum wage breaches. The 2008 HM Treasury pre-budget report reported on the consultation on the use of travel expenses in conjunction with being employed via umbrella companies. The document questioned the validity and fairness of allowing business expenses in this form, suggesting that an overarching employment contract was not a form of employment that allowed travel and subsistence expenses. It was reported in November 2008 
that, and I quote Alistair Darling, the Labour Ex Chancellor of the Exchequer, was last night tipped to define an umbrella company in Monday's pre-budget report to help close a tax loophole they used to deprive the Exchequer of £300 million. The outcome when the announcement came was, and again I quote, the Government has decided to leave the current rules unchanged. So, a problem was identified back in 2008 and the then Labour UK Government failed to act. However, no thank you, you have said enough. However, workers caught up in this situation are not interested in who is to blame, only who will act on their behalf to remove the loopholes and resolve their pay issues. Success of UK Labour and Tory governments have failed to tackle the issues surrounding umbrella companies. Therefore, maybe it is time that the Scottish Parliament had the opportunity. The difficulty is that, that employment law is reserved to Westminster. The S2UEC submission to the Smith Commission under the section Better Labour Market and Workplace Protection requested, I quote, the devolution of employment law, health and safety, trade union law and the minimum wage. The submission continues. The default position under the current constitutional settlement has been for primary legislation on equalities, employment law, health and safety, trade union regulation and minimum wages to be reserved to Westminster. Whilst this division of powers exists between Holyrood and Westminster, it is not the case across the whole of the UK. In Northern Ireland, all of the legislation listed above is devolved to the Northern Ireland Assembly. Unfortunately, no thank you. Unfortunately, this proposal to devolve employment law was blocked by the Labour Party. So we have a situation where UK parties have done nothing to address this situation surrounding umbrella companies, and on Holyrood is barred from tackling it, and workers are therefore caught up in a situation that need to be resolved urgently. The difficulty is that those who could have done nothing. Many thanks. I now call on the Minister, Annabel Ewing, to respond on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes or thereby, Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I uh, would like to welcome those union representatives that I understand may be in the gallery tonight watching our uh, proceedings. And I, I apologise I was not able to come out to meet with, with some of them uh, today outside the Parliament, for in fact I was actually already in a meeting with some Unite uh, members uh, further to a meeting arranged at the behest of my colleague uh, Christina McKelvey, MSP, and that meeting was with the Cabinet Secretary and myself, and we did indeed uh, discuss a number of uh, workforce issues, uh, including of course umbrella uh, contracts, and we heard about the really unacceptable abusive practices uh, that are going on uh, in the construction industry, but also in other uh, sectors. Uh, and we heard particularly of the problems in terms of compulsion, in terms of denuding workers of their rights, and of course of reducing uh, their pay and, and conditions. So I do thank uh, Mr. Finlay uh, for bringing this uh, important debate to the chamber tonight by way of a members uh, debate. Um, it, it should be noted, of course, that uh, in terms of uh, employment uh, law issues, uh, the UK government has pursued uh, a programme which I would say has resulted in the slow dismantling of employee rights, rights that have been built up over many, uh, many decades. Uh, and uh, indeed, to cap it all, uh, advances made to employ employee uh, rights legislation in recent years have been undermined by the introduction of uh, significant levels of fees for employment tribunals uh, in effect. Uh, pricing workers out of justice. Um, some points were made, uh, a few of which I would pick on, uh, upon at this particular point, presiding officer, um, just to, to provide some clarification. I think Cara Hilton mentioned the situation in Wales. Well, my understanding is that whilst, of course, Scottish government officials have been speaking uh, to their counterparts in Wales, um, we did try to obtain a copy of the, the draft guidance that the Welsh government is currently working on in terms of procurement policy, but they were not keen to give us a copy. Uh, but I do understand that it may be that the statement made by the Welsh uh, Minister the other week might be subject shortly to some clarification uh, in terms of the powers that they actually would have. 
uh, to do what the minister uh, wanted uh, to do. But as far as the uh, Scottish Government uh, is concerned, uh, we of course are taking action on workforce matters uh, and that against, as has been mentioned by uh, members in the debate tonight, and that against a backdrop where power over employment law does still lie with the uh, Westminster uh, Government. Uh, in terms of the general issue of fair work, of course, we are absolutely committed as a government to pursuing the fair work uh, agenda. Uh, and we will see in, in the months to come the establishment of the Fair Work Convention, which was uh, announced in October uh, last year, further to the publication of the Working Together report, certainly. Neil Finlay. I have never disputed the fact that many of these issues lie with the UK government. I, that is accepted. What I do dispute is that the Scottish Government can do nothing. The Scottish Government can do plenty if it has the political will to change procurement guidance and, and contract tendering to prevent many of these things happening. Will the Minister do it or not? Um, I, I listened to Mr Finlay and I, I do know that probably his heart lies somewhere else on the, the constitutional debate on this issue. But the fact of the matter is that the party that he is here representing in this parliament does not seek this parliament to have powers to deal with these uh, important issues that would impact if we had the powers to the benefit of workers in Scotland. Rather, he prefers to have these important matters over employee, no, I'm sorry, I've only got seven minutes, over employee rights and pay and conditions to be determined even by a Tory government at Westminster, rather than this democratically elected parliament in our country. That is the problem that Mr Finlay has, and in every debate of this kind, presiding officer, he tries to square a circle that just cannot be squared. But in terms of the action that the Scottish Government is taking within the powers that we do have, we will be setting up the Fair Work uh, Convention. Uh, and members may be interested to note that we are currently uh, finalising the membership of the remit and the remit of the uh, Convention. In the Convention, we will have uh, employers and unions working together to pr promote a progressive uh, uh, workforce uh, policies and, of course, the promotion of the living wage. At the same time, what we uh, will be doing is seeing the introduction of the uh, Scottish Bus Business Pledge, uh, uh, which the First Minister uh, confirmed as part of the Scottish Government's programme for government, which at its heart is a partnership, a compact, and that the government will indicate that it will support a strong and competitive economy uh, so that government and employers together are able to support a fairer, more prosperous Scotland. But in return for support from the Scottish government and its agencies such as Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we want companies to commit to the Scottish approach by, for example, paying the living wage, not using unacceptable zero-hours contracts and not using unacceptable umbrella contracts and uh, by implementing indeed other progressive uh, workforce uh, policies. Um, presiding officer, uh, in the area of procurement which has been mentioned, it is clear <laughs> that the key problem, as I've said before only a couple of weeks ago in a members debate convened by Mr Finlay, the key problem is that we do not have the power to set uh, the minimum wage rate. If we did have that power, which we, the Scottish Government, sought for this Parliament in the Smith uh, process, if we did have that power, we would not have to uh, approach the issue uh, on a denuded basis in terms of what we can do in terms of guidance uh, on the procurement uh, front. And in that res regard, um, I don't know if Mr Finlay is aware, I think he did suggest that we hadn't uh, published guidance or there had been some delay. There's guidance on the government's website, uh, a Scottish procurement policy note, uh, dealing with uh, workforce issues, including with expressly umbrella contracts. So I, I do recommend that he has uh, a read of that. Um, so we will do, uh, continue to do, presiding officer, what we can uh, using the powers uh, that we have, because we are determined to do what we can to ensure that workers have the rights that they are entitled to expect to have in the 21st uh, century. Uh, what I would conclude by saying, though, is that with our hands tied behind our backs, we do not have the employment law powers that even uh, uh, we heard from Gordon MacDonald, Northern Ireland does. We don't have those powers. We would really like those powers. And I suspect, uh, notwithstanding the publication of what can we call it, the VOW Plus presiding officer, I don't know uh, what it's called, the, whatever they were up to, uh, the Labour Party the other day, not even in the VOW Plus did they call for devolution of employment uh, policies. So I think they have to have a long, hard look about where they are going in terms of seeking to protect uh, the rights of workers in Scotland. But we are clear, presiding
presiding officer that we want to have the power to protect workers' rights. And in the months ahead, presiding officer, I suspect that the people of Scotland will be considering these matters very carefully indeed as we approach the Westminster election in May. Thank you, presiding officer. Many thanks. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you all.